And now it's my great pleasure to introduce Tom Frazier, one of the founders of The Advocates and a current board member to present the Don and Arvon Frazier Human Rights Award. Good evening, everyone. As Robin said, I'm Tom Fraser. I am a board member. I'm back on the board. And 40 years ago, I was one of the founders of the Advocates for Human Rights. Tonight, tonight I'm proud to present the Don and Arvon Fraser Human Rights Award to retired Minnesota Supreme Court Justice Alan Page. Don and Arvon, my parents, believe that each of us has a part to play in protecting human rights and the rule of law. They work to implement human rights practices locally, nationally, and internationally. In their honor, this award is presented to an individual or organization committed to the promotion of human rights. The advocates are presenting this award to Justice Page in recognition of a long career dedicated to human rights and social justice. Let me give you just a few of the many highlights from his career. One of his passions is the education of all children. He has used his public platform to promote a proposed amendment to Minnesota's Constitution that would recognize the fundamental right to education and the state's responsibility to see that all children receive a quality education. The public discussion of that amendment is an important first step in acknowledging education as a fundamental human right and recognizing our collective responsibility to provide quality education to all children. When he was inducted, When he was inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Justice Page said, and I quote, yes, the things I'm suggesting are simple, but I've learned from school, from football, and from the law that even the biggest, scariest problems can be broken down to their fundamentals. And if all of us cannot be superstars, we can remember to repeat the simple fundamentals of taking responsibility for ourselves and for the children of this country. We must educate our children, and if we do, I believe that will be enough. But he hasn't just talked about the importance of education. 35 years ago, Justice Page and his wife, Diane Sims Page, founded the Page Education Foundation. The goal of their foundation is to motivate and assist Minnesota students of color in the pursuit of education after high school. The foundation provides financial assistance to those students and requires them to give back by tutoring and mentoring young children. Those tutors and mentors, called Page Scholars, have volunteered nearly 500,000 hours working with 50,000 children across Minnesota to create the next generation of scholars. Justice Page has also educated all of us about social justice. He and his wife assembled an extraordinary collection of artifacts of black history, including symbols of Jim Crow laws and institutional racism in the United States. They have shared their collection publicly in an exhibit called Testify, with the hope of both generating conversation and moving people to action. In 2018, the National Football League Players Association renamed its highest honor as the Allen Page Community Award. It had been named after a justice of a different Supreme Court, a former NFL running back named Byron White. That same year, Justice Page was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom. President Obama has described this medal as, and I quote, not just our nation's highest civilian honor, it's a tribute to the idea that all of us, no matter where we come from, have the opportunity to change this country for the better. We are all connected in the human rights movement. Justice Page believes that if each of us takes responsibility and plays our part, 
we can create a world where everyone lives with dignity, justice, and equality. For his role in making the world better, we are proud to present our highest honor, the Don and Arvon Fraser Human Rights Award to Justice Alan Page. I want to take my journalist hat off. My name is Fred de Sam Lazaro, by the way. I'm a shoe leather journalist. I'll take that hat off momentarily and put my immigrant hat on to say thank you to the advocates. Um, I have a portfolio on uh, the PBS NewsHour that's loosely called the Undertold Stories Project, and it's sort of self-evident uh, what kinds of stories we do, and so. It's unusual, if not unnerving, for me to, uh, to interview probably one of the most told stories in Minnesota over, the, over time, and that's the story of Alan Page. But hopefully, we'll learn some things that we don't often hear from you. And the shoe leather journalist in me, Justice Page, wants to bring us to the news of the day. And we've been awash in the last 24 hours or so in headlines about the soaring Spike, the spike in juvenile crime in this city. And just yesterday, an all, there were calls and pleas for an all hands on deck effort to do something with these, with these children. And I was drawn to the quote that was cited by Tom Fraser just moments ago about how you can take scary big problems and break them down into the fundamentals and work on those. So the question is, what are those fundamentals that are failing our children in this town, in this community, and God knows in many cities in America? Well, before I get to your question, let me just say thank you to the Minnesota advocates for the honor they have bestowed on me this evening. As I have often said, um, I'm never quite sure that I'm worthy of the recognition and the honor, particularly when I see the work that the other honorees tonight do, the volunteers, the, the work that they do. I have to ask myself, how did I get in this line? But. I suppose it's, it's a recognition of the work that not only I have done, but the work that Diane and I have done. Um, she was a woman who believed strongly in justice, whether it's social justice, racial justice, or gender justice. Her passion for justice knew no bounds. And she um, was and continues to be my partner in the work that I do. And so on her behalf and on my behalf, I say thank you. I should start out by apologizing for not allowing you to, to begin with no, your acceptance. No, no apology needed. Um, to your question, the fundamentals that um, bring us here today. I think it was 
Martin Luther King Jr. who, and I'm going to paraphrase here, said, people who have hope want to build the community that they're in. People who lack hope tend to want to destroy it. And it seems to me, based on my experience uh, on the bench, my experience visiting classrooms across this state and across this nation, that for far too many young people, they have lost hope. And the question becomes, how do we reinvigorate that hope? How do we create hope? Well, I certainly don't know all the answers, but one of them is to ensure that every child, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their wealth or lack thereof, no matter their ability or disability, can see themselves having a better future. That gives them something to work towards. As I say, um, my experience on the court, you know, there were far too many kids who came through our system, um, our criminal or juvenile justice system. Some of those, let's be realistic, some of those kids, some of those young people lack the moral compass. But for the vast majority of them, they had simply lost hope. And what's the song, um, what does the song say? Freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Well, without hope, you're kind of free to do whatever comes to mind. And I think that's what we're seeing today. But the question isn't, you know, we know what the problem is. The question is, what are the solutions? And whose responsibilities, or where does that responsibility lie? You know, it was Mark Twain, I think, who said, never let school interfere with your education. And, you know, a lot of the focus now is on fixing the schools, but what about the larger environment and community in which our kids are growing up? I think we give people the opportunity to fix themselves to the extent that they're broken. Um, and we spend time fixing schools. We spend uh, time... Uh, in our schools trying to, and quite, quite frankly, some days I'm not sure what we're trying to fix, but we're not giving children the tools to prepare themselves for a better future. I was just refreshing myself uh, today, looking at the, the metrics that we use to measure academic success, for example. Um, the legislati legislative auditor concluded that 46%, 46% of all, I believe it was, I can't remember what grade level it was, it really doesn't matter, 46% of the kids in Minnesota are reading at grade level. Wow. Forty-six percent. That's the overall number. For children of color, it's down in the low twenties. Hmm. I'm not sure by what standard, and we like to think here in Minnesota that, you know, we we're all above average. 
We might be, but it's low. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm not sure by what standard we think that that is acceptable. But yet we accept it because that's what we are confronted with. You've by now provided scholarships to thousands of young people who are clearly motivated. They are committed to mentorship, etc. What have you discerned from that experience and whether there's an anecdote that brings that to life, if not data, that tells you it really works? Well, um, the, the paid scholars that, that uh, you're talking about, mm -hmm. they're just kids. They're just young people. They're nothing, you know, they come from all over the state. Some of them are, um, I suppose, would qualify as the best and brightest academically. Some of them struggle in school. But we have a motto at the foundation, creating heroes through education and service. Our scholars, by both word and deed, inspire young people to have hope. And in the process, they create hope for themselves. And invariably, the young people that we uh, serve. I mean, I, if I could tell you uh, where, what the magic is, I mean, I can tell you what it is, I can't tell you why it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but our, our scholars are phenomenal. And they're just but average young people who see a better future. But you also call them to service beyond you know, their own personal achievement. Absolutely. They, they spend 50 hours per academic year serving young children across the state. Those young children they serve get to see somebody who maybe looks like them, comes from their community, somebody who they can relate to. You know, we talk a lot about heroes and role models. Well, the fact is that the people that influence us are those we can reach out and touch. Not many of us have the ability to reach out and touch athletes and entertainers and all of that. But all those young children that our scholars serve can reach out and touch them. said the athletic superstar who never aspired to be one. You always aspired to be a lawyer, if I'm not mistaken. You know, I started playing football in the ninth grade because my brother, who was ahead of me in school, played. Turns out I had some aptitude for it. <laughs> um, but it wasn't something that I necessarily aspired to. Loved every minute of it on the field. There were parts that I wasn't in love with, but um, loved every minute of my playing. Was able to, or found that um, there was more to it than just throwing your body around. Um, that there was as much art as there was science. And I love the art of it, and I love the science of it. And you were gifted as well with discipline and focus, which is something that personally I admire very much. If, um, but, but if, you, you never lost sight of where you were going well, post your NFL career. Right? If, if, if there is one thing that one key to my athletic success, my football success, it was the ability to focus. 
on the task at hand and not be distracted by um, all of the things going on around you that don't help you do the task at hand. And that stayed true um, to my interest in the law, which began long before I had any interest in football. It was the Brown versus Board of Education decision that triggered that, right? Well, there were a number of things that triggered it. Brown was one of them. Um, I was eight years old when Brown was decided. It's about the age we start asking children, you know, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I'd heard stories about the law and lawyers. No lawyers in my family didn't know any. But in the eight-year-old mind, the stories that I heard were lawyers made lots of money, <laughs> didn't work too hard, <laughs> played a lot of golf on Wednesday afternoon, <laughs> and drove big fancy cars. And for a young black kid growing up in a country that where large portions of it were subject to state-sponsored segregation. And even though I didn't grow up in one of those areas, uh, there was still segregation. The prospects for somebody like me back in the 1950s, uh, things went really well. I might have been able to get a job in a steel mill. At that young age, I had nothing wrong with working in steel mills, but I recognized that that wasn't for me, that the work was dirty, dangerous, and repetitious. I had an uncle that spent 40 plus years in the steel mill. And early on, I, didn't, I knew I didn't want to do that. And so when you balance dirty, dangerous, and repetitious with not working too hard, big fancy cars. <laughs> in, in, in the eight-year-old mind, it goes straight to big fancy cars every time. And, but you're right. Brown versus the Board of Education was decided. And for me, that was sort of the, I don't know that I'd call it the aha moment, but it was certainly a moment where the ground shifted even for a young kid who um, had no real experience with the law. The, um, for me, it was the beginning of an understanding that the law had the power to bend the moral arc toward justice to help people solve problems, and to help people generally. And that's something that seemed to fit me. You and I had a brief conversation at your most recent um, awards event. <laughs> I don't know where you have the shelf life. Uh, the shelf <laughs> space, sorry, not shelf life. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> I, I won't. This, this would be tiring. I, I, I won't tell you about the shrine. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, when we were talking uh, offline, you, you, know, you mentioned three key areas of focus that we as a society should have, um, character and, um, and education. And we've, we've talked abundantly about that now. And the third one you said was, was race. And uh, it's astonishing to me, having lived in this community for 40 years and working for a national news program that I could never sell a story about race from Minnesota. It's, go to Detroit, go to Chicago. This is not a place where you have urban issues happening. And after May 2020, that changed dramatically. And um, who knew that this would become the epicenter for what many people call a reckoning on race in this country. Do you sense there's been any movement at all from this landmark 
event in the whole journey of the civil rights movement, race, the pursuit of racial justice and inequity? Well, as you know, um, after the death of George Floyd, we had um, a spasm, if you will, of anger, of frustration, of um, protest. And the question that I asked myself then and I still ask myself today, was that the beginnings of a movement or was it, was it just a moment? And I think the jury's still out. I'm not convinced that it was a movement. Um, and I'm not convinced that at the end of the day, other than a lot of rhetoric and a lot of talk. And philanthropic dollars too. That anything will change. Indeed, across the nation, we've seemed to have gone the other direction. Yeah. I've just also, one of the things that this brings to mind is the whole notion is we watched video from three, three uh, years ago in Minneapolis. This was a crowd that was as rainbow, if not predominantly white, on the streets. Uh, and I just wonder if we've learned anything through history about the shelf life of allyship. How do you sustain allyship and how do you keep the interest up among people who are not the immediate targets of social injustice, white people for the most part? Well, you know, it's interesting you say not the immediate targets. We're all in this boat together. We're not in it sort of some of us are in, some of us are out. We are all in this together. And as uh, Paul Wellstone always said, we all do better when we all do better. Well, we all do worse when we don't all do better. And the idea that um, some of us lose interest, mm -hmm. well, if that's the case, then, um, then the, the future is not going to be very bright. Do you think that it's plausible that that, in fact, does happen? that the interest wanes? Well, you know, everybody can't be, and everybody's not going to be, at the highest level in t of intensity all the time. That doesn't mean that people aren't engaged. That just means that uh, we have to come up with a more sustained way of acting. And, you know, our, our track record isn't very good as a nation. We've got very short attention spans. And it doesn't matter what the subject is. We've got short attention spans. I know, I work on t in television business. We <laughs> deal with short attention span all the time, even at PBS. Just a couple of final things. One, one, another issue that comes up, uh, especially these days, is um, the demise of affirmative action, which you know, many scholars are predicting can happen any day now. And there was an interesting report in the New York Times, I think it was yesterday, that talked about the unraveling, if you will, of alliances that had historically held together on this issue and, uh, and that disintegration, if that's the right word for it, uh, was, was manifest in the referendum that went down to defeat in California where they tried to preserve affirmative action. Well, I just wonder what, what that's gonna do. 
How's that going to ricochet in America when this happens? Well, we've, you know, we've lost sight of, and there have been forces to, working to make us lose sight of what the purpose of affirmative action is to address the present effects of past discrimination. We have um, not only not addressed the present effects of past discrimination, we want to ignore the fact of present discrimination. And um, we've, we've sort of turned into everybody's in their own bunker, every group. Indeed, we've gotten to the point where it's almost every individual. I think you take a look at some of this gratuitous violence, whether it be gun violence or whatever it may be. It's a function of, um, it's all about me. It's not about us. And I don't know how we lost that, but I think to some degree we have. So that when it comes to something like affirmative action, um, well, if your group gets something, my group must be losing something. But I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think when you win, I win. And um, I don't know how we get back to that. Well, we can uh, perhaps start in this room finally. Um, this is a room full of lawyers and some parents of lawyers, <laughs> many if not most kindred spirits. And without presuming that they're not, and I'm sure many are, um, you know, what did, what's your advice generally on how best to engage with the pressing issues of our day, selecting them perhaps, but just truly engaging them in a way that feels both fulfilling and has some demonstrable impact? I, I guess I would analogize to um, some of the issues we see in education. How do we get at those? How do we get at uh, people who have lost hope? My solution is to go spend time in schools, talking with young children about my path to where I've gotten to, and asking them how they plan to get down their path. Spend time uh, encouraging them, talking with them, not at them. And I think that's just one example, but I think we have to be engaged. And not, not so much for um, what we might get out of it individually but what we collectively get out of it. As, as I said, you know, connecting with people, I mean, let's face it, these are people problems, right? And where are we gonna find the solution? We're gonna find the solutions in people and the interactions of people. Is it just a, a challenge of scale? Because there are good models. One of the things, you know, one of the things we discovered with the foundation, you know, our scholars are African American, they're Asian, they're Latino, they're Native American, they're um, immigrant kids, and 
when we, some of our programs we put on, we asked the students, our scholars, to put them together. And we were, quite frankly, somewhat concerned because everybody's in their bunker, right? How do you get them to work together? Well, you ask them to work together and they work together. And all of a sudden, those barriers, those bunkers disappear because we're all people trying to, you know, weave a fabric of our lives. And um, when you intertwine them, it can work. And there are examples even in our own reporting um, of um, multidisciplinary approaches to, um, to solve problems that um, have, have been attacked from silos. Hennepin Healthcare has an extraordinary program, for example, in coordinated care it has reduced costs and hospitalization you know, enormously. The Rollins Scholarship Foundation, yours, your own example. So it's just a matter of scale. Well, and you know, I, 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 I've had the good fortune to have two schools named after me. Justice Page Middle School in Minneapolis and Justice Allen Page Elementary School in, in Maplewood. Maplewood. And you, I walk into those schools and you talk about interdisciplinary, what's going on there in both of them and they're they're both quite different but that approach is something that's common to both of them and um, good things are happening in both places you know i was in south africa a few years ago and had the chance to interview archbishop desmond tutu at a time when the country seemed like it was just falling apart this is just a few years ago and he'd been outspoken in his criticism of the government and I remember asking him whether he was an optimist about the future of the country and he said something that's always stuck with me which is I am not an optimist I am a prisoner of hope <laughs> and I think uh, you bring that you personify that in many ways in our community here and uh, Justice Allen Page, it's been a real privilege to talk with you this evening. Thank you. Thank you.